For all its blood and guts and explosive action set pieces that cut no corners, where Helsing decides to serve its most interesting entertaining qualities is not in these surface level attractions, but in the complex and subtle utterings of its character personalities, motivations and relationships, which prove to be deeper than anyone would originally think, and the Helsing manga and adaptations of which forms this story takes place as, offer little desire of their own to make it more known on a level they deserve. It makes sense to start the analysis by looking at Alucard. He's on the front cover, he's listed at the top of character lists on anime databases for the series, and he is the character that is most easily identifiable for people who aren't familiar with the manga or anime, but despite being the face of the Helsing brand, it feels wrong to, at least narratively speaking, call him the main character. That title seems closer related to the archetypes of another vampire who is no less important. In spite of that, he's still the main attraction and standout feature, posing as the commanding force for a number of the greatest action sequences Helsing has to offer, and as the centre of attention for much of the supporting cast's interactions. One of the most potent themes in the story, and one which Alucard is most firmly situated in as the primary example of, or as motivation for characters when following this idea, is that of monsters and humans. It's easiest to start off analysing this particular part of the Helsing narrative by looking at Alucard's backstory and the origin of his vampire identity. Helsing's closest relation to the original gothic horror novel is its rendition of the vampire origin as being Dracula, inspired by Vlad the Impaler. Alucard spent the start of his life as a Turk a slave and prisoner to the rulers of the land, but eventually became a warrior of his own will, gaining infamy for his cruel punishments of any who opposed his methods or anyone who he deemed evil. He waged war on the Muslims, but was so strong in his belief that accomplishing deeds in the name of God was the only way to get his attention, even going as far as to sacrifice his own forces to achieve such goals, that only a small portion of his soldiers attended what would be his last battle. He lost the war, becoming a prisoner to the Turks once again, but more than that, he was a broken man because of his absolute failure on the part of his kingdom, his people and his family, all of which were lost because of his greed for revenge by way of violence and power. Then, thinking over these failures on the site of his execution, he drank from the puddles of blood left over from his destroyed homeland, and in turn, was revived as a vampire. That's the story leading up to his abandonment of his humanity, but the first we see of him as a vampire is his defeat at the hands of Van Helsing. Possibly the strongest aspect of Alucard's character over the course of the series is his desire to be bested in battle by a human, which stems from this loss against Van Helsing. The paladin Alexander Anderson is who Alucard believes will have a chance to win against him at this point in time, which explains why they both seem positively thrilled at the notion of facing each other at any given opportunity. They are in agreement as to being each other's nemesis, and like most rivals in storytelling, there's a certain underlying similarity between them. Prior to becoming a vampire, Alucard's ambition was to invoke the hand of God through his many tribulations. Words were not enough to justify his faith, 
performing great actions on the battlefield in the name of God so that he himself would intervene and bring light to his impossible dreams was the only course of action. This mindset is all too familiar when it comes to Anderson, who sees himself as a weapon of righteousness who will extinguish the evil hellish creatures of the world, of which Alucard is perhaps the most powerful and the ultimate final boss. Alucard's current relationship with God has however changed since his time as a human. When he drank the blood, he relinquished all hope or connection with God. He felt abandoned despite his many sacrifices, and so he abandoned his faith right back. But there's an unclear shift in his attitude sometime between the events of his defeat by Helsing and the start of the series. His hate for God has seemingly totally dissolved, and in a weird turn of maturity, he has accepted the fact that it was his own vision vicious warmongering against the power who enslaved him during his youth that resulted in his eternal servitude to the Helsing family now. Before, he used God as an excuse for his extremely destructive actions and, all in all, his past self seems morally inferior to the attitude that Anderson possesses today. Whereas Alucard abandoned God by drinking the blood, Anderson embraced him by becoming a holy weapon, which is all he ever really saw as his purpose in life. Before the start of the series, he even extended the boundaries of his potential by becoming some sort of weird healing mutant with an extended lifespan, so he could at least have some fighting chance against Alucard, and now he's become a pure force of nature bent only on destroying him. Away from the religious sacrifices, however, Anderson's dismissal of his humanity in order to enact that will proves very troublesome for Alucard's own wishes. From the moment of his arrival in Episode 1, which might I add is one of the coolest and most badass character introductions I've ever seen, Alucard noticeably thrives off engaging in combat, especially against fellow powerful or skilled individuals. Time and time again, he faces more threatening challenges, using just the right helping from his near limitless source of power to ensure the fight seems evenly matched, until he reaches a point where he has either had fun toying with them, realising that they have nothing left to offer, or he loses control and unleashes a little more than necessary to win. Either way, despite in some cases thoroughly enjoying the encounter with a huge smile on his face, he ends up being somewhat disappointed that the challenger didn't meet his expectations. One of the earliest instances of this occurring, and where you can clearly see the turning point in Alucard's emotions during the fight is when a horde of vampires attack the Helsing home base. Instead of ending everything near instantaneously, Alucard waits in his chambers for one of the leaders of this attacking force to come find him. He doesn't even get up from his chair at the onset of this fight, and the exact time where that switch flips is when this cowering figure laying before him, someone who is a powerful vampire in their own right, calls Alucard a monster. <laughs> They've lost all pride in themselves and given up in the face of complete failure, two things that act as a reminder to Alucard's painful past as a human and which make him absolutely furious. Alucard is only interested in humans like Van Helsing who persevere despite their impending doom. Perseverance and pride in one's own humanity are the human traits that Alucard deems most valuable, and anyone who possesses these in the face of such hardships are whom he he respects and admires for being stronger than he was all that time ago. Another example is the encounter with Rip Van Winkle, who starts going off the deep end of despair, but Alucard actually manages to convince her through his presence and words to fight back in her last moments, and earn a more prideful death. These fights, and any others like them, are mere minor disappointments, and pale in comparison to the sheer rage we see in Alucard when Anderson makes a similar decision. For 
Alucard or these vampires that faced him are nowhere near as exciting as the thought of a genuine human being able to rival, perhaps even beat him, but at the very least force Alucard's level 0 state to be released, during which all of the lives he has within him can be vanquished. He'll make it last as long as he pleases, cherishing every struggle they go through, but when losing to a virtually unbeatable opponent, Anderson doesn't just give up his fighting spirit and his life, he gives up his humanity by using his trump card and becoming just as much of a monster as Alucard as a final resort to defeat him. Alucard goes from pleading for Anderson not to make that decision to being absolutely furious that he did, to entering a state of complete depression, losing all desire to fight back against this monster who will end him. It's not even a case of being disappointed at Anderson himself anymore, but this one fight which they'd both been building up to over centuries has been ruined. He most certainly would have preferred Anderson retaining his humanity to the bitter end, even if that meant another human being added to the pile of all who had failed against him and his dream of being killed at all by a human being gone. <laughs> During the series, Alucard likes to use various versions of the phrase, that which defeats a monster is always a man. Alucard himself is a monster who kills other lesser monsters, but from his perspective, those kills come entirely from the will and command of his master, Integra. Just like Anderson becomes a weapon of God, Alucard sees himself only as a weapon to be used in the hands of the Helsing family. The actual desire to eradicate a monster from existence must come from a human. If a monster defeats another, there is still whichever one is left to be feared and dealt with but a human can defeat another monster in its entirety without any equivalent exchange, just a simple elimination. Whereas the monster searches for conflict as a form of sport, humans will attempt to defeat a monster to protect others. To further explore such themes, we need to take a look at the role the Major plays as the main antagonistic force in the story and how his personal ideologies relate to those of the other characters. The arch enemy of Integra and someone who has set his eyes on Alucard as the source of hatred to inspire him to achieve such an insane goal as launching a full on attack on London using nothing but a small army of phony vampires. Someone with destructively arrogant ideas of what makes someone a monster instead of a human, which have caused him to spend nearly 60 years devising a plan that would destroy a city, kill millions of his 
innocent inhabitants and sacrifice almost the entirety of his own forces for only two reasons, to satisfy his love of war and prove himself the better warmongerer than Alucard. But despite all that, there's a certain pathetic irony about him. He loves war so much that he's dedicated his life to it, yet he can't shoot someone at point-blank range, and his appearance is that of a short, fat man. In fact, the last thought that goes through his head before dying is an expression of joy over finally shooting and hitting something. Despite being a self-proclaimed madman, the Major never loses grip of the pride that he has, in his opinion, maintained his humanity. He confidently admits to his own purpose of evil, whilst mocking the heroic actions of those opposing him on the battlefield, like Anderson, who has dedicated himself to righteousness. Whereas, these other forces have more defined goals, whether they seek the eradication of evil vampires or to dictate a religious order, Millennium has has no purpose or meaning beyond the waging of war. The only complexity they possess lies with the Major, who views Alucard as being inherently inferior to himself for giving up his humanity to gain power as a vampire when the Major, faced with a similar fate, didn't. He hates Alucard, who has the pleasure of waging war forever through eternal life, who has so much personal power that no one can beat him one-on-one, -on -one, who can shift his body any way he likes and to any age, all of these pleasures in life despite abandoning his identity. But that's the one thing the Major has over him. He is himself. A singular entity existing in one body rather than a mass of millions of souls. Only because, when on the verge of death, he rejected the temptation to drink the blood. He denied himself that power and that opportunity to wage war for eternity so he could justify his own superiority, a point of view that he actually shares with Alucard. After achieving his goal and on the verge of death again, he lays this all out with Integra and Ceres as his witness, but not in the villain tells the heroes his plan kind of way. He is truly confident in his principles and wants desperately to convince Integra that because he is a human who has killed the monster Alucard, he is superior. Monster. However, Integra of her own strong willpower does not serve the same ideologies as him. To put it simply, according to the Major, a monster is someone without its own autonomous will, which is why Alucard is a monster to him, because he follows Integra and does her bidding, and consists of an amalgamation of all the lives he has consumed. On the other hand, Integra has the opinion of a monster being hellbent on nothing but destruction, so to her, the Major is most definitely a monster, and up until recent realizations on her own part, she probably viewed Alucard as one. As well. The saying that accompanies the title card and which Alucard uses as a release mechanism of his final binding refers to the Bird of Herms. The Bird of Herms is closely representative of Alucard himself, who limits his own power by loyally following Integra. What the Major doesn't know or doesn't understand is that by definition of allowing himself to be limited by a human, he shows both a will of his own and anti-destructive tendencies. With the exception of Ceres, he is the only vampire in the story who exhibits this behaviour, and I think the moment that Integra starts to view him in a different light, not just as a monstrous weapon, is when he adopts Ceres at the start of the series. The true extent of Alucard 
Integra's complexity doesn't come to being fully realised by Integra until the final two episodes, when she remembers the words her father had said about him on his deathbed, when Alucard is brought back to reality by the voice of Ceres calling out to him, and several decades into the future with the three of them reunited. <laughs> In the world of Helsing, Integra is one of the only characters who is unwavering in attending to her duty, taking up the mantle as the commanding figure of the Helsing organisation after the passing of her father. She delivers orders with the utmost stoicism, keeping her head straight in all but one or two situations, and works without rest, meeting resolutions to whatever vampire-related issues that happen to have the misfortune of finding themselves under her eye. She cleans up the mess left behind by her vampire Empire associates, dealing with the political details demanded by such a unique purpose as her organisation serves, all whilst handing out her own acts of justice by defending what is hers and delivering the final blow to the enemy commander. On top of this, she sees the value in both Alucard and Ceres outside of their abilities to be invincible killing machines, and it is perhaps her fair treatment of them that results in their separate attachments to her. Alucard pays fealty to the Helsing name, as he must, but still respects her an enormous amount and willingly submits himself to her every command, whilst egging her on to allow him to commit such violent acts, even those against regular human soldiers. Whether it be out of boredom, self-awareness, or genuine pleasure in carrying out her commands, Alucard, under the guidance of Integra, has taken on a whole new role as the Bird of Herms, a monster who tricks and kills other monsters, whereas his past relationships with previous masters, such as Integra's father or Van Helsing himself, didn't involve utilising his power, but locked him away like a rabid dog. Alucard certainly respected Van Helsing only for the fact that he was a human able to defeat him, but Van and Arthur both only ever treated him as a manifestation of evil. Van, at the most, used his body as a test subject, and the only time Arthur employed him as a weapon was to fight alongside Walter during World War II, and other such severe scenarios. Neither of them saw him as having free will, cared for him as an individual, and certainly didn't take advantage of his potential as Integra has in order to advance the limits of her organisation. If Van Helsing didn't use Alucard based on his own principles of good and evil, and Arthur Helsing only used him in the most dire circumstances, then this relationship between him and Integra stands out with an essence of mutual respect. Despite being his boss and having absolute power over him because of limitations placed by Van, she treats him as her most valued employee, giving him the private jet experience, royal hotel accommodation, and his own living space under her roof. She's constantly aware of the depth of the people around her and actually comes across as quite nurturing and forgiving despite her cold exterior. It helps that she always upholds her responsibilities, but doesn't deny that a battle much bigger than her or any other human is taking place out of her control. Possible counterpart to Integra would be Maxwell, who ends up being eliminated by his champion combatant, Anderson, for trying to use his power for personal gain in succeeding God. Where Maxwell loses his head in control of the Vatican army, Integra maintains an integrity that ensures Alucard doesn't end up in the same position of executioner as Anderson. What might be more impressive than her general demeanour is how swiftly she changed and started acting as a leader as a result of the events following her father's death. Her only relative intended to kill her and claim authority over the organisation for himself, and her butler and bodyguard, who had been entrusted by Arthur to protect Integra following his passing, was nowhere to be seen, leading to Integra's unintentional awakening of Alucard in the dungeon that he resided. These experiences as a teenager instilled a strong distrust for those around her, even though she relies on and cares deeply for Walter in particular. The only one she trusts with absolute certainty to carry out her demands is Alucard, whom she keeps mostly as a secret to the outside world. You can see the speed at which she changed when one of the monetary providers for the organisation comes to see its new commander, and the stern look she gives him before she realises that he's harmless and lowers her defensive performance. <laughs> Thank you.
The adult Integra we see for most of the series spends much of her time alone or keeping people at arm's length, remaining straightforward in her dialogue, cool and collected in the face of what would otherwise be an unusual occurrence such as a vampire attack, and overall isn't easily swayed by the opinions of her less informed allies. On top of this, she has adopted a firmly masculine image, wearing suits, smoking cigars, and being addressed as Sir Integra, or even her entire name, by those who are either mocking her or acknowledging her prowess. You could say this is partly to engage with the entirely male lineup of allies she works with, so that they take her seriously and see her as the true successor of the Helsing family name. However, as a contrasting idea, she retains her feminine beauty by keeping her hair absurd absurdly long, and even flaunts her virgin status as a symbol of her resolve and to antagonise the vampires who oppose her. She's fully aware that she needs to stand up against the stereotype of a passive, weak female leader, developing these habits as a deterrent to being immediately written off as inexperienced, which isn't half wrong. The respect she earns from people like Alucard, Walter, and Sir Penwood comes partly from her stoicism in a role that's still quite new to her. But again, these habits aren't entirely for show and actually represent a deeper change in her psyche. The two explanations for her withdrawal of her feminine attributes are firstly her lack of a mother growing up, which led her to have little emotional investment in anyone besides her father, so when he died she lost the only person she was close to, and secondly that up until Alucard's dedicated service she has been repeatedly let down by male figures throughout her life. It's no coincidence then that the two individuals who she chooses to have closest by her side are the two vampires that serve under her. On a more personal level, outside of the mutual respect between herself and Alucard, there's a definite sexual tension that she later transfers to her relationship with Ceres. Just focusing on her long-established relationship with Alucard for now, it seems to come mostly from his personality. With Integra acting as the provider to his limits, she is controlling the extent of the amount of pleasure Alucard can derive from his combat experiences. When she releases his powers more, or commands him to carry out her demands, as she does repeatedly via the phrase, Search and destroy! 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 That is more valuable to Alucard and adds more meaning to his actions coming through him from her as it would be if he had free reign. He even teases Integra by asking whether it aroused her to see his work of slaughter at her command, poking fun at their peculiar dynamic in a playful way and amusing himself in the process. There's also the fact that by the end of the series, Alucard has consumed Integra's blood on at least two occasions. Firstly, when she was a teenager and her blood revived him to save her, and secondly, when he returns decades into the future. She even comments on her old age as a hint that she's sorry to have missed the opportunity of exploring her young adult years alongside him. <laughs> <laughs> but he makes it clear that to him, age makes little difference, something that is also evident during his conversation with the Queen. It's clear that Alucard comes off as quite charismatic to a number of the characters who trust him, or at least those who understand how he truly respects humanity for being able to live with their physical flaws and accept their old age. That's why Alucard proves his utter devotion to Integra at every opportunity, who despite her limits is greater than he ever was as a human. As seen during the encounter with Valentine, he has the ability to unleash some of his restraints himself, but he puts that leash in Integra's hands and fully trusts her every word, especially those affecting the output and subsequent reigning in of his immense power. It seems awfully fitting that the start and end of the series is marked by a blood offering from Integra. She acts as the solid foundation for the other protagonists and the story at play, but she is not the element that strings together and completes this three-way relationship.
I mentioned at the beginning that I don't consider Alucard to be the main character of Helsing, but it would be more accurate to say that he is the main character in meta terms as the face of the brand, and as the seed from which all the other characters have grown from. I'll admit he's definitely the most crucial for all the events that take place before the series begins and then during it, for no other reason than all plans revolve around his existence. But when it comes down to the aspects of the character itself, he doesn't go through the necessary developments and doesn't change the lives of the other protagonists in ways that would be essential to a main character. The female vampire, Ceres Victoria, who shares his blood, has more personal qualities that suit this title. From her childhood traumatic experiences, her vampire origin, the changes in her actions and feelings as the series runs along, and her role of representing the audience's introduction to this world. She's the most out-of-place presence in nearly every scene, acting bewildered by the passionately hammy dialogue and unique personalities of many she encounters, whilst she comes to grips with the ins and outs of her very unique vampire identity. In fact, one of the most fundamental aspects of the housing narrative to explore involves how Ceres discovers new things about herself through her relationships with Alucard, Integra, and the mercenary Pip Bernadotte. Let's start off with her and Alucard. Card. It's important to understand that Ceres is a revolutionary anomaly as a vampire, which translates over to the complications of the monster-human individual collective personality dichotomy within vampires. The relationship between her and Alucard is a fantastic interpretation of the bond between vampires, one which closer represents a willing cooperation rather than being a forced servitude, which creates a highly functional companionship wherein both individuals maintain the entirety of their free will. Just by nature of being vampires, in addition to being people who work intimately together in dangerous situations, means these two will endure a bond far extending the depth of any human bonds in both mind and body. One of the things that makes Ceres a unique vampire is that she didn't become one out of fear of her own human weaknesses, but was forced into the transformation with the only alternative being death. At the time of their first encounter, Alucard gives her a decision she can't refuse to die or to become a vampire. The scene reached this stalemate out of Alucard's desire to play with his prey, so when the enemy uses Ceres as a hostage, he has a moment of contemplation. You could even argue that Alucard orchestrates this by saying that his adept markmanship would allow him to shoot past Ceres and hit the enemy directly. Even if the vampire needs to be shot through the heart to die, that initial shot through the head would pose as a distraction to get a better angle. What's interesting about Alucard's behaviour, and why it seems like he manipulated the situation a little bit, is the way in which he gives that choice to Ceres without directly explaining what would happen to her. He asks her, Oh George! Just minutes earlier, she experienced a similar interaction with the enemy vampire, who laid out his plans to forcefully take her virginity, and then claim her as his mindless vampiric slave. From Ceres' perspective, she has gone from someone declaring that she'll be their slave, to someone asking her to be their slave, and through her own deductions, she might have the uncertain thought that the latter would warrant retaining her free will. Alucard tells her that he's seen who she is and believes she should triumph, not coming from a place of lustful greed like the enemy, although Alucard's own ambitions are certainly tucked away in his words of charm, and he has the upper hand as someone who just killed all the surrounding mindless vampires that Ceres herself was just losing against. When Ceres chooses what she might see as the lesser of two evils, answering his question of her virginity, there is zero hesitation in Alucard's delivery of a bullet to end the enemy. It's only then, standing over the dying police girl, that he elaborates and makes sure that her decision is not to die, whatever that means. But why does Alucard even give her a choice in the first place? Why not just let her die like all the other innocent humans who are unfortunate enough to find themselves between Alucard and his duty? In a later episode, he has a conversation with Walter that sheds some light on this. When asked why he turns Ceres, Alucard says, Alucard 
<laughs> the human traits we've come to know Alucard respects are exactly what he saw in Ceres, but instead of it being someone he's battling against, it's someone he has a chance to save, and instead of it being someone who has already reached that pinnacle where he doesn't mind being killed by their hand, it's someone who has potential he can nurture. Even if he wasn't aware of this and simply acting off his gut feeling when offering to turn her, he definitely realises later when she hesitates to complete her vampiric transformation by choosing not to drink blood. To Alucard, nothing could be easier, especially since it would allow her to reach the absolute peak of her potential power, but for Ceres, it just isn't that simple. She has a feeling at her core that there are necessary developments she still has to go through with whatever remains of her humanity, and that fully committing to becoming a vampire at her current mindset wouldn't be beneficial for her future. Alucard is so adamant, even ecstatic, to see her become like him before his very eyes, but it all gets complicated when she essentially asks him to take care of her during this period of self-actualization, which funnily enough is a desire to become one's best self and could be considered the peak emotional need of humanity. To go further with that idea, using Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we can see that throughout the series, Alucard, Integra, and Ceres, in their own ways, reach a point of fulfillment of all the needs. For Ceres specifically, she has the basics of food and shelter at Helsing Manor, the safety and stability in her career and health under their protection, the sense of belonging and love, strong respect for herself and her masters, and with all these pieces together will accept her past and future. From Alucard's perspective, he remains by her side but pulls back on leading her down a path that would end closer to what he has become. Having such complex emotional needs and coming to grips with one's own identity are struggles that have probably been long forgotten and have gone drastically unfulfilled for all the centuries he's been stuck mostly by himself. A similar realisation occurs during episode 3 when they are attacked by a regular human SWAT team. Ceres is confused and dismayed by how easily Alucard Alucard mows down dozens of more or less defenceless humans when she was under the impression that the Helsing organization eradicated only monsters like vampires to protect humanity. She questions her master's relentless brutality, which he sees as a naive criticism of his choice and ability to defend himself. <laughs> After spending so long as a vampire and experiencing the lowest depths of depravity even during his years as a human, Alucard doesn't discriminate between the capability for evil in humans and whoever else. However, after seeing that Ceres wasn't just defying his actions but being actively pained by this reality, he shows genuine empathy for her emotions and the innocence caused by the fact that she was, until recently, human herself. In her eyes, especially as a former police girl, any of those SWAT members could have been her. Instead of shouting in her face, he relaxes his angered expression and very softly says, This interaction is probably most easily compared to a parent berating their child for making a simple mistake when they clearly either don't know better or can't fully comprehend their own feelings whilst separating it from the objective truth. Up until this moment, Alucard has spent the rest of the scene sort of enjoying toying with the SWAT team as they watch their buddies being ripped apart, but now, after Ceres presented her morals and her pain to him, and also had the courage to defy him, he seems more humble in his power and regretful to have so abruptly massacred them all with little regard to her presence. <laughs> Hi. 
This is something he adapts to the longer their relationship goes on. Early on, he most likely expected her to complete her vampiric transformation and go off on her own, but having someone who relies on him as a source of comfort and guidance, instead of just assuming that, that she would immediately want to take advantage of her freedom following her resurrection, has brought a number of crucial long-lost elements of Alucard's identity back into the fray, and ultimately healed parts of his humanity. By the time we've reached the climactic battles of the series, you get a much more clear feeling for the effect Ceres has had on him. When Anderson becomes a monster of God, he almost takes Alucard by surprise at just how powerful he has become, as well as using Alucard's current murky state of mind to his advantage. Impaled by the bayonet and covered in flames, Alucard gets stuck in his own thoughts as if everything around him is in slow motion, and instead of eventually fighting back by himself, he just sort of accepts the situation filled with a mixture of apathy and sorrow. But lost in an endless sea of his past regrets, all of which have been brought centre stage by witnessing Anderson's transformation in front of him, he is pulled back to reality and pulled away from the brink of death by the voice of Ceres. As if they weren't already strong enough rivals, an interesting comparison can be made between Alucard and Anderson, as both characters are given virtually opposite helpings of hope that suits their wishes. Anderson, following his defeat, gives an endearing speech to Alucard, who weeps over his dying body, letting him know that his purpose has been fulfilled to its absolute limits, and he will find happiness in death in the arms of his loved ones. He's finally been put to rest and granted peace by God, who he has diligently served better than any other man for all this time. On the other hand, Alucard's hope comes from prospects of the future that awaits him. His farewell to Anderson closes this chapter in his life, where he seeks his own defeat at the hands of a worthy hero. Now, his purpose is to love and protect his student, Ceres, and his master, Integra, and it's Ceres calling out to him like a lost child that makes him realise this. His past is free to be forgotten in favour of new and brighter possibilities. <laughs> Not long earlier, he had reunited with Integra and Ceres, donning the appearance of his old Dracula armour, and he acknowledges her growth. If not for this reunion, his mind's image of Ceres may not have been complete enough to envision her grasping for him within that prison of thorns. Despite her new immense power, she still feels that connection with Alucard and that they belong together. Their relationship can't be defined in just one way, because it encompasses everything that they are. As a consequence of Alucard being the one to turn her into a vampire, they may be considered master and slave, but instead of Ceres being forced at her own expense, she will continue to serve him willingly for her own desires. She will submissively cling by his side because he provides for her the belonging, security and love she was denied as a human, and she was the perfect anomaly for Alucard to step in and partly replace her needs for family, friends, teachers and lovers for this brief window. The death that Alucard has been seeking all this time is now the only path he can never go down, at least not in such a self-destructive way. The connections built between him, Ceres, and Integra are worth living for and have become the only things he can't turn his back on. That reuniting moment also includes the presence of Integra, who continues to act as a support structure for their triangular relationship. And on top of meeting Alucard's needs as his master, she has quickly grown fond of Ceres in more intimate ways. She quickly becomes quite perceptive Obsessive of Ceres interrupting Anderson's attempt to kill her and claiming that the female vampire belongs to her, showing that she has accepted Ceres into the organisation and decided to stand up for her after Alucard took it upon himself to bring her into this strange world. Even if Alucard, at this stage of the series in particular, turns Ceres out of his own selfish desire to have another vampire accomplice to keep him company, that won't stop Integra from having her own fun as well. Whereas Alucard is a century-old monstrous vampire who long ago lost sight of his individuality, Ceres is a female newcomer, the only other female at the Helsing organisation and the only other vampire to ever join their side. That gives Integra the chance she needed to open up with someone on a less professional level, and that she does, with Ceres becoming the only person Integra initiates physical contact with in the entire series. As we explored before, it's hard to pinpoint the exact reason why Integra has adopted a more masculine role. 
and why she might seek romantic love from another woman rather than a man. She was lacking any male affection and her life was devoid of any female companionship, so the arrival of Ceres brings an exciting new possibility to delve into and a fresh change of scenery amongst all her male comrades. The eventual outcome of her supposed sexuality and when she dies of old age may very suitably signal the end of Alucard's service to the Helsing family, because Integra won't pass the genes down to any other human. Instead, she will continue to exist within the bodies of her vampire companions, birthed from her voluntary blood offerings. The act of sucking blood from a human as a vampire is commonly presented in a very sensuous manner. Although I'm sure the sensation a vampire goes through during their meals is incomparable to any human experiences, Helsing shows us a character dynamic wherein the opposite side of the exchange is pleased by giving their blood of their own free will. Integra finds joy in seeing her underlings grow in power and being a direct physical part of their development herself. She becomes a part of their evolution despite her inferior human body, whilst giving them the greatly sought after taste of pure virgin blood which if you were a vampire food critic would be of the highest quality. The inherently sexual nature of a vampire tasting blood is often displayed as an act of feral lust with the vampire's eyes all sultry and their tongues ravishing amongst their pointed teeth and even a strong blush strewn across their cheek. This is no less true in the exchange between Integra and Ceres, with the blood dripping from a small gash in her finger which she elegantly strains above Ceres' open mouth. You could theorise that having blood given to you instead of taking it would produce different results from one's vampiric transformation, which leads to Ceres becoming one of a kind, but it's safer to assume that the mental fortitude she gains from having her own morals protected and outright supported by her companions is the only thing necessary for her to retain her humanity. She hesitates to drink blood, feeling that becoming a vampire would diminish her humanity, but having her hunger satisfied by Integra's donation means she can stay true to herself and take her time with the process. Another time Integra looks out for Ceres is during the attack on Helsing Manor, when she witnesses Ceres' feral ferocity coming out during a moment of panic and vulnerability. She gets caught up in the slaughter of the vampire invaders, no longer ripping them apart out of self-defence and the defence of her master's home, but out of total euphoria for her own violent capabilities. This marks one of the only occasions in the series where Integra loses her composure, the other notable ones being when Alucard and Walter pass away. She is thoroughly rattled by the sight of a bloodlusted Ceres. What was once an innocent, slightly awkward police girl is now gnashing out chunks of flesh and tearing off limbs. But it's not the goriness of the violence itself that stuns Integra, it's the devilish gaping smile that Ceres has on her face whilst she does it, which reminds her all too much of Alucard. Integra runs over with zero regard to her own safety and embraces Ceres. She already has one monster to wreak havoc at her command, so she is pleading to Ceres as a friend not to go down that path. For the benefit of everyone, including herself, Ceres needs to continue as a light in the darkness, taking the other protagonists into the future with her. If Integra is the foundation and Alucard is the engine, then Ceres is the glue that holds this narrative together. Her youthful innocence and benevolence only get stronger as she matures away from the police girl she once was, trapped and unevolving in her past traumas, frozen in a state of childish emotions. Choosing to join Alucard and meeting Integra have opened the doors to fulfil her womanhood, accepting and taking pride in the protection of her own submissive sexuality, which once upon a time she was more afraid of than anything. She is sexualised on numerous occasions and always fights back in one way or another, all apart from that blood donation from Integra, because her attitude depends on the intentions of the one sexualising her. Early on, when the vicar and girls attack and grope her, she is ashamed of the violations, but still shows a determined mindset not to give in, whether that be a disapproving glare or ripping them to shreds. However, the relationship that really adds nuance to her sexuality is with Pip. <laughs> huh? <laughs> <laughs>
From the onset, she proves her physical superiority over him, which he ends up admiring and seeing her as a one-of-a-kind woman. That power he and his men see no fault in relying on when they need her help most during Zorin's attack. After their line of defence has been broken, and it's been made all too obvious that their human bodies only take them so far in surviving against vampires, they unanimously agree to allow this odd police girl to take care of the rest. To the envy of his men, Pip tries to sneak in a kiss before she departs, which of course she protests against, but in a completely different way to previous attempts to sexually engage with her. This time she understands that it's coming from a place of admiration of both her capability to protect them and her unabashed attractiveness, which for this tight-knit group of stone-cold mercenaries makes her a pleasantly unique ally in battle. If anything, her rejection of the kiss only serves to prove her worth more to them, and they show their acceptance of her through a small pat on the bum. She bashfully turns around to see their smiles directed at her, and the faces of the accomplices of the arse patter who gleefully surrenders. It's such a small act, but relieves whatever tension there is in the air, like a group of comrades laughing in the face of death and enjoying the company of this girl. Now, after they've confidently put their lives in her hands, she trusts herself more to get the job done, and feeling a part of the team, she isn't ashamed of their simultaneous reliance and admiration for her. Not long later, after nearly all the men have been killed, and Ceres is blinded by the nightmares of her unresolved past, Pip sacrifices himself to give her another fighting chance. It's at this moment when Ceres can only reach out and feel Pip covered in his own blood in front of her, that she kisses him and thereupon takes a part of his soul inside of her. It's almost tragic that this girl he has quite clearly fallen for and could see being the reason for him to settle down and have a family, instead of aimlessly fighting for cash, can only fulfil a romantic relationship by becoming a part of her. But unlike in cases where Alucard consumes somebody, Ceres seems to subconsciously reserve a free space within her to maintain his identity. He saved her in his final moments, with the hope they might escape and survive together, and now he'll be supportive of her from her very core. She is willingly giving him the space inside her to feel and think as she does, showing her utmost trust and affection for him and her own reliance on his personality to drive her forward, which he is given as a sort of parting gift to get her through whatever comes after he's gone. Instead of taking the role of a protecting guardian of her as Alucard did, he is giving her the spirit to protect herself, and in reply she'll continue to survive so that his soul is preserved. Why she allowed him to take a spot within her is the same reason she took Alucard's hand in episode 1. These two men have influenced her view of her own identity and sexuality by asking for her consent and symbolising the great value they put on her life by becoming physically synonymous with her. Ceres cannot exist without Pip, and Pip cannot exist without Ceres just like how she would have died if Alucard and her didn't metaphysically bond in a similar manner, and Alucard wouldn't have been able to return decades into the future if that sliver of him didn't reside deep within Ceres. All in all, it's hard not to commend the extravagant connections that have flourished between this small group of misfits. how Ceres reciprocates their affection through her nuanced sexuality to heal her damaged identity, and take up the mantle as the sexual root of all their essences carrying the seed by which each of them individually survives by and helps her bloom. For all of Helsing's blood and guts, tragic childhoods, demonic mechanical tyrants, and sexual undertones, I'll always remain impressed by how seasonably happy this ending transpired.